you very much, Voter. Um, yeah, so yes, my name is Crystal Bailey. I'm Careers Program Manager at APS. And what I do, first of all, can everybody hear me okay? Yeah. Even in the back? Okay, I tend to be a loud, projecting type person, so great. Um, so what I work on at APS are programs to inform students, as well as their faculty mentors, about the real career outcomes uh, for, for physics graduates at all degree levels and also provide some resources that will actually help you better prepare for the, your future careers. Um, so all of the programs that are oriented towards that at APS, I am the point person for. If you have any questions about any of it, email me, bailey at APS.org. It's right there uh, on, your, on your person. Okay, so breaking the myth of the non-traditional physicist. Uh, I guess you've all probably heard the term non-traditional to refer to physicists who are working outside of academia. Well, my purpose today in giving this talk is to basically challenge that nomenclature uh, and give you kind of a more holistic sense of what, what the real employment picture is for physics graduates. But first, a little setting groundwork. Who is a physicist? Well, I say a physicist is anyone with a physics degree. That is a bachelor, master, PhD, BS, BA, anyone with a physics degree. Why would we define it in this way? Why is that important, an important point to make? And those who are coming in, please, if you, if you feel like it, please come down. There's lots of room down front. <laughs> well, first of all, this definition is actually consistent with other disciplines such as chemistry or engineering. When you see many other STEM fields, their bachelor's degree graduates are called a chemist and an engineer. So that's consistent with other STEM fields. It defines a common set of experiences and texts. So for example, a PhD student will fondly remember his, his or her Griffith's e &M, for example. Uh, and we've all had, you know, department colloquia. We can all talk about the, the chips and the stale cookies, at least not here, elsewhere. Don't get me wrong. But most importantly, I think this inclusive view is, is better for the survival of the discipline because there are career outcomes, as you will learn, for physics bachelors, where the bachelor is your exiting degree, and master's, and PhD. In fact, all at all degree levels, there's very, very low unemployment for physics majors. And as you will learn, uh, very few, relatively speaking, of those jobs are academic jobs. And I think that a lot of students who might otherwise be attracted to physics don't go into physics because they think that it doesn't lead to a career outcome. So if we start including bachelor's, master's, and PhDs in our discussion of physics and physics careers, I would argue that it will attract more students and it will retain more students. What makes them physicists? Well, so a shared familiarity, not just with the culture of, I'm sorry, not just with the same physics concepts, but also the culture of the discipline and sort of what we just talked about is definitely an example of that. But I think the most important point to be made is a basic physics training imparts a very important essential problem solving skills, basically how to think. And that is the hallmark of a physicist. And that is present at bachelor's, master's, and PhD levels. Physicists are very comfortable walking into a situation where they don't necessarily know the answer, but they're gonna figure out what they need to do, or they're gonna teach themselves what they need to know to solve a problem. That's very distinct of our discipline, the physics discipline. And that is definitely something that employers recognize. Where do physicists work? Maybe not where you think. Where do you think they work? Somebody raise your hand. National labs. <laughs> well, some of them do, that's a good guess. Where do you think most of them work? Company, industrial company. Sorry? Industrial company. Um, actually that is correct. <laughs> <laughs> but it's not usually the case that somebody guesses that. Um, okay, so let's, let's examine this, okay? What is a traditional physicist then? What is traditional physics? Is it a professor, uh, any PhD researcher, um, or the most common career path? You know, some people might think that's academia. But first, let's back up. According to the AIP Statistical Research Center, about one in six physics bachelors will actually get a physics PhD, okay? They go into a lot of different areas. Some physics bachelors 
Go straight into the workforce, absolutely. A, a decent size of them go into the workforce. Or they go to graduate school and get a master's in another field. Or they get an editing master's in physics. Or they do a PhD in another field. So one in six of physics bachelors will actually go all the way through to their physics PhD. So about 17% of all physics degree holders, bachelor's level, will actually become physics PhDs, and by extension, <laughs> traditional physicists. Well, right there, I have a problem with this statement, if that's how we're defining traditional physicists, because we're actually cutting out a lot of people who start, who are physicists. They have a bachelor's degree in physics. There's that. All right. Now let's look at the PhD. I'm going I'm to work my way down. We're going to start with PhDs, and then we're going to talk about masters and bachelors. Okay. So, at the time of this 2014 report from the AIP Statistical Research Center, the number of physics PhDs conferred in the U.S. was the highest in the past century, possibly ah, ever. Uh, 1,762 PhDs granted in this country. Yes, there are, you know, there's U.S. citizens and non-U.S. citizens added, but that's the total granted in the United States. Okay? Based on the current enrollments, so based on the, the numbers that the AIP has right now, projecting a few years into the future, um, it, it should level off around this number, around 1,700 uh, or so. There's no reason to expect, based on enrollments, that that number will decrease in the next five or six years. So the bottom line is, we can expect to continue putting large number, numbers of physics PhDs into the workforce. That's something we can expect, based on our current knowledge. What are PhDs doing with their degrees when they graduate? So this is the employment type of the physics PhDs initially when they first go into the, into the workforce after receiving their degree. Um, now, this is kind of an interesting table. It's broken down strangely, but this is the overall percentages, okay? Yep, 60% academic initially. But if you look at the types of jobs those are, it's mainly postdoc and other temporary and very few potentially permanent and then this, these columns are, of all the postdocs, how, how are the postdocs distributed? How are the temp temporary jobs distributed? Mostly those are academic. Um, there's a very small number, potentially permanent and academic. And the vast majority of those that are potentially permanent are private sector jobs. 64% of the permanent jobs, potentially permanent, are in the private sector. Okay. Okay, the majority, 86% of graduates who initially go into academic sector are postdocs or temporary faculty, and the remaining postdocs go to national labs. So the SRC <coughs> also, in their survey, asked, you know, what were their reasons for taking these kind of temporary jobs? Well, it probably surprises no one if a PhD, for example, has designs on becoming an academic phys physicist they understand that they will have to go through maybe one, maybe two, maybe three, God forbid, postdocs uh, in order to get there. We understand that postdocs are a very common uh, interim step. And that's, so that's what people actually said. The most common reason that they gave for taking temporary postdoc or assistant professorships was that it was a necessary step to get to a future position. This is not crazy because when you actually look at the immediate previous employment of new physics faculty hires, um, and it's true that there's a very big difference between how this breaks down at PhD serving and bachelor serving institutions. Maybe you're aware or not, uh, but there are some very, very important cultural differences between bachelor serving institutions and PhD granting institutions. Um, but at the PhD serving institutions, most of them came from a postdoc, then the most common previous employment was research scientist, then a tenured or tenure track professor at another institution, only 1% coming straight out of their PhD, uh, and adjunct part-time or visiting faculty. Bachelor serving, it's a little bit different. There's slightly more folks coming in with straight out of their PhD, that's a little bit more common, but still, becoming a new faculty hire with only a graduate degree is very unlikely. Extremely in the case of PhD serving, and quite unlikely in the case of bachelor serving institutions. Okay. 
Yet, the number of departures of tenured and tenure track faculty has changed little since 2003. And I apologize that this is a slightly older report. It's about the last one for this came out about four years ago. But I have talked to the SRC if there have been any changes since the last time the report came out. Only very minor changes, which I'll share in a moment. Um, but if you look at the tenured track or tenured faculty, uh, the total number, man, it really hasn't changed very much at all. Um, this is PhD survey, master survey, and bachelor survey. And their quote is, while there are about 350 departures by tenured and tenure track faculty in 06 and 07 academic year, there were 475 recruitments. Recruitments means job searches. So that means they put out those many job searches. Um, with 342 tenure and tenure track faculty hired the following academic year. Uh, and that's consistent with what they've seen in prior years. 350 departures, 342 hires the previous year. It's a workforce that is replacing itself at best. The change I refer to is that there has been a slight uptick in the number of those temporary assistant professor positions. Those have, there's no commitment from the institution. They're two, three years. Um, so those are more of those temporary sort of jobs. So that, there's been a slight uptick in that for, for a variety of reasons. Um, but the tenured permanent faculty jobs uh, have not changed. That market has not changed. And not all faculty positions are created alike. So this is an, another distribution from that same report of how many different types of faculty jobs existed at the PhD, master's, and bachelor serving institutions. And at bachelor's, you see a very different complexion than PhD. Um, fewer tenured and tenure track, a lot more full-time temporary, whereas at the PhD survey, there's a lot, mostly tenured and tenure track, and these non-tenured permanent, full-time temporary, and other are less prominent, but the point is that even if you get a new faculty position, you may spend time shifting around or waiting for an opportunity uh, that, that's more aligned with what you want. So the bottom line is the job market for faculty in universities and other institutions is very stable, <coughs> meaning that overall not many jobs are being lost. It's a very important job. We need, we need people to do it. That market will never go away, but it's not a growing market is the key. But you recall the graph I showed you at the beginning of the number of PhDs that are being put into the American workforce in principle. Uh, given that there's over 1,700 PhDs now being generated per year in this country, more than half of them going into those postdoc positions with the intention of trying to become academic faculty, you can clearly see that supply is going to continue outweighing the demand for that particular academic path. And it's good you know this now, but it's great news, okay? Because the unemployment rate for physics PhDs is less than 4%, okay? So anytime you hear anybody say, there aren't any jobs for physics PhDs, that is a lie. <laughs> there aren't that many academic permanent jobs for physics PhDs. Let's talk about PhD employment in the private sector. So that, that graph I showed you earlier that had the potentially permanent jobs, 64% of those graduates who went into the permanent employment positions were in the private sector. <coughs> According to the NSF survey of doctoral recipients, so the stuff I showed you before was the AIP SRC, which was initial employment. A new report comes out every three or four years. There's also the NSF survey of doctoral recipients, which they also publish every three or four years, but they include a much larger uh, data set. So these, are P these could in principle be PhDs who got their degree in 1965. This is like a whole array. This is a much later <coughs> snapshot in some of these folks' careers. <coughs> According to them, in 2010, the private sector was the single largest employment base for physics PhDs. It was 47%. The next highest was 38, uh, was academic at 38%. It was also true in 2001 when the private sector employed 46% of physics PhDs. It was also true in 1993 when the private sector employed 46% of physics PhDs. This is a slightly outdated graph, and the only reason it goes to here is that I haven't put, made one with more data points. All of these are real. <laughs> I just haven't put them on the graph. But I, my intention of showing it to you is the first year they took the survey of doctoral recipients was 1971. And well, 
It's been between 40 and 55 percent the entire time. So, industry has been the largest employment base for physics PhDs, taken as a whole for decades. And we are physicists, and we are scientists, and we live the life of the mind. And we're not necessarily in this for money. That's not what motivates us, right? But it doesn't hurt to mention um, that when you look at the PhDs who went into the private sector, okay, these are by far the two most highest paying types of, of jobs for physics PhDs. But this government lab job, this is not a postdoc. That's down here. National lab postdocs are pretty good, and they do pay well compared to academic postdocs. Um, there are fewer of them, okay? Same thing. These jobs up here that we're talking about are permanent staff scientists at national labs. Plum jobs. Science all day long. <coughs> paid really well. Very few of those, okay? Not saying don't go for them, I'm just telling you this is how it is. Um, when you look at, you know, these are definitely the highest paying, but private sector jobs also pay pretty well for a lot more of them. And in fact, if you do, th this is exactly consistent. I ran a very similar uh, set of data from the NSF survey of doctoral recipients, had the exact same outcome. When you look at the highest paying, there were definitely government and private sector jobs, there was like an order of magnitude more private sector jobs. Okay. University and four-year college, and, and you know, this is on average, um, and then uh, uh, postdocs and national labs and academic postdocs. Okay, so that, that's my point. The private sector offers well-paying employment, well-paying employment to physics PhDs, and I will add, I have a good friend who got her PhD in higher energy physics, and she works for CNA Insurance. She did predictive modeling, now she's more advanced in management. She will point out that this, this salary does not include your bonus. <laughs> Just saying. All right. Now, what about the non-PhD physicists? Well, again, 83%, everybody with this one in six, uh, they will not actually go and get a physics PhD. They might get a PhD in something else or a master's in something else or go into the workforce, but they're not going to get a physics PhD. Okay. What about all these other people over here? Roughly a third to a half of physics bachelors go straight into the workforce. It has varied since 1995, but it's in between a third and a half. We'll go straight into the workforce with their bachelor's degree in physics. That surprises some students a great deal, because I did not think that that was a common outcome when I was a physics undergrad. Another third will go into graduate school, uh, physics and astronomy, so that's the kind of ones that are on that track and won't necessarily finish that track, so they're on the track, and then the remainder will go into grad study in other fields, finance, law, medical. Medical physics is actually a degree that is distinct from a master's degree in physics. Um, what types of employment are possible for these degree paths? Normally I have a lot more content here, but I'm going to kind of breeze through this because there's some other stuff. There's a little preaching I want to do at the faculty right here. Um, not that I think this department really needs it. Uh, anyway, for master's degrees, about 50% of exiting master's, well, so this is very common for people who have a bachelor's degree to actually go into a job and then earn their master's while work, still working in that same job. So this includes those who either enter the workforce or remain in the workforce after getting their degrees. Um, look, 44% of those private sector, still the largest employment base. Uh, college and university, government, high school teachers. Um, college and university is a really interesting category for master's degree students, and actually a lot of lab directors um, and people who support the department in that kind of way, that was a very common track. Also, you do get, do get a fair number of master's recipients who are faculty in community colleges and two-year colleges. So that's primarily what this category is referring to. Government, national labs, there are some research positions for master's in national labs. I have a dear friend who is in that position. Um, and high school physics teachers. So those are examples of these careers. Um, of those who actually go into the private sector, almost entirely, they're all STEM. Well, no, sorry, all but 13% are, are STEM of some kind. So engineering, computer and information technology related, natural science, physics and astronomy, 
in the private sector. So mostly STEM related work that these masters are doing. Now let's look at physics bachelors, okay? So uh, about 40% between 1995 and 2012 averaged over about 40% of the bachelors went straight into the workforce after graduation, okay? 61% of those in the private sector. Um, college and university, this is another interesting category. The physics bachelors who were in colleges and universities, those were mainly also working, either teaching temporarily, helping run physics labs. Those were pretty much exclusively students who were there temporarily awaiting going to grad school or doing something else. So that's that category. High school, definitely physics bachelors teaching high school, very, very important. You would be shocked to know how few high school physics teachers even have a minor in physics, you guys. So if you're at all interested in that, you're desperately needed. Okay. But if, and there are actually some careers for bachelors in national labs. And, and there's a profile of one of them on our, on our website, but it's a relatively small number. Of those who went to the private sector, a little bit more of them non-STEM, that's because it's such a broad training, they wind up in a whole host of different areas. Some are doing sales, some are working at banks, People are doing all kinds of different stuff with their bachelor's degree. I know somebody who is an actuary, um, a lot of different stuff. But the vast majority of them, 70% of those going into the private sector, again, STEM-related fields. And I'll tell you, for physics bachelors who go to the private sector, um, they're not going to have physicist in the title of their job. They're going to have engineer in the title of their job, or analyst, or technician. Um, and they're going to be working on interdisciplinary teams with other STEM graduates. They're going to be, there's a great anecdote that was once told, me, told to me about how in any given company, there's a role for each degree type of physicist. So for bachelors, they're going to be working on these teams. They're going to be solving part of a problem. They're going to be coding. They're going to be troubleshooting, uh, working on a very specific aspect of a problem. The master's degree recipient in that same company might be managing a team of bachelor's degree holders on that project. Maybe they're called in to help them troubleshoot more difficult aspects. They're also going to be making sure that the project stays on target, that they're using the right resources, that they're communicating with the right people further up uh, to make sure everything is where it should be. And then <coughs> the same company, and I'm, I'm describing a rather large company here. That's important too because small companies work very differently. But in a larger company, a PhD would be in R&D, and they would be doing actual physics research, either in or out of the subfield of their dissertation, and, and developing new products and new processes. So there's a role for each degree path within a company in the private sector. And as you can see, that's where the majority of all physics graduates go. Bottom line, at all degree paths, the largest initial employment sector for physics graduates is the private sector. Okay, shifting gears a bit. Um, why? Why are our graduates so valuable to industry? Well, and this is true for bachelors, but also true for advanced degrees. Um, but a lot of what I'm about to say really pertains to bachelor's degree training. Um, standard physics curriculum creates familiarity with technologies commonly used in the STEM workforce. Nowhere more so than here and with the maker space and all the great kind of applied physics you guys are doing here. Um, programming languages, for example, C++, Fortran. I challenge any one of you to go to the APS job board today, click on, there's a filter you can set for four year degree jobs. Just look at what the employers are asking for. <coughs> you have all of those skills, okay? Uh, circuit design, diagnostics using an oscilloscope, soldering, Understanding how to wire things up, understanding how electricity works, mathematical proficiency, linear algebra, hello, differential equations, insanely useful. Fabrication, lathes, bandsaws, 3D printers, okay, you know how to build things, you've done things hands on in your research. We know this from the language of job descriptions, okay? Uh, the common job titles that uh, across the STEM recruitment. There are employers, you know, APS is part of a shared jobs database, okay? And they have, they are recruiting physics majors on purpose, otherwise they wouldn't 
have posted their job on our job board, which is for physics, physicists. Um, analyst, engineer, developer, those are the common titles, but their activities are performing testing and analysis, developing and designing, implementing, running queries and reports. This is the language in the job descriptions. They also tell us. So we had a very interesting meeting out in Denver, uh, UC Denver with Randy Tag, where we brought together a bunch of people who were CEOs of companies, startups, who all had physics backgrounds. We had this really interesting focus session. We talked about this. And the one thing that I remember most clearly, Nate Seidel, who is actually the uh, CEO and founder of Spark Fund, cool company, they make pretty cool stuff. Uh, and, I, and I'm not meaning to, I, I'm not meaning to offend any engineers here. I think the point is that engineers and physicists in all STEM disciplines bring something unique and special to the table. That is absolutely true. But the way he characterized it, and he has a PhD in engineering. He is an engineer. He said engineering is about putting a period on the end of the sentence. Okay? The engineer may write the code or design the, design the device to fit the very specific need, but the physics guy or girl <laughs> understands what it has to do in the larger context. Why is this the approach we need? Or maybe they were the ones who drew upon their deeper understanding of physics knowledge to suggest that this is the right approach. We need, we need a thing that does this. How about this? This is a, this is a new idea. Um, and together, together, they are very effective. Okay? Uh, Kettering University is really interesting. They have a uh, engineering physics track. There are many places around the country that are looking at that. But they're one of, the, uh, they may be the only one, I don't know, but one of the few, that's actually ABET accredited. And they have done some surveys of the employers that their students had, you know, they have a project where the students go out into industry, they work on a project with an employer out of the academic department entirely. And there's a really interesting survey that they did, asking the employers for feedback on students. 80% of surveyed employers agreed that physics majors could easily grasp new knowledge and concepts. Sharp, quick on the uptake. They were able to generally problem solve. They could identify, formulate, and solve problems. We need to get from here to there. Let's figure out a way to do that. They were very, very comfortable working in that kind of nebulous space. Like, we don't have the answer yet, but I believe I can get there. They were able to be very, very good at working with data. Data, data. Excel, MATLAB, crunch and numbers, interpreting the data, knowing how to really work with it and, and mold it to get the answer, get, actually to get the, the right answer to the right question. Could uh, competently use computer applications and databases. That's part of your general training. Uh, using current technologies, again, familiarity with things like oscilloscopes and soldering irons and 3D printers and whatever technology, uh, and could engage in continued learning and problem solving. Again, always being able to sort of teach themselves new tricks. They didn't, they didn't need somebody else to teach them. They could teach themselves new things. It was continued learning. If they didn't know the answer, well, they got the book and they read it and they figured it out. That was very important. But um, what else did they say? Well, they said they're missing some very important training and experience. Ability to design a system, component, or process to meet a specific need. And what that means is industrial design. Um, the best way to build the particular thing that has to fit here, do this, and stay under threshold X. That's an that's a engineering folks that really got that down. Um, Ability to function on multidisciplinary teams, okay? Um, and this makes sense too, because as I've said before, there's very few disciplines where as a, as, you're, as a student, you're led into a room and said, here's a bunch of junk, build X, bye. <laughs> that has literally happened to me. And so I think as, as you do research as a physicist, you are used to, it's the downside of, of being so self-actualized is that you feel like you have to do everything from start to finish. You have to see the project through every step. When in fact, there is a point where it makes sense to say to the engineer or the computer science person, you know, this is your area. <laughs> I'm gonna let you handle that. 
but that's what that's what actually allows problems to be solved more efficiently, and that is what industry is interested in. That's why you're on a multidisciplinary team. <coughs> the ability to recognize the value of diverse relationships. You're not just dealing with your buddy or your boss, but also your boss's boss maybe, and maybe a customer. You know, you might need to learn to shape the way you say things or describe things to your audience to be more effective. That was kind of a weakness. Leadership skills was also kind of uh, called out as a weakness. Um, familiarity with <coughs> basic business concepts like cost-benefit analysis, funding sources, intellectual, property, project management. Just knowing what these words mean. Very useful in, in the private sector. Communication skills, oral and written, learning how to tailor your message to an audience. I've seen this multiple times in evaluating student presentations at meetings. When I walk up to a student, they often assume that I know as much as their advisor and that my mission in talking to them is to test them or make them look bad or trip them up somehow when in fact I have no blind clue what they're saying. Even though I have a PhD in physics, I don't know about you know this particular very specialized field, um, the best presentations I've seen are when the students ask me, do you know, what do you know about X? And I'll say, nothing. And then they're able to start and really tailor their message to me as an audience and the quality goes up by a thousand percent. <coughs> Real world experience in companies, just being in a company, being familiar with the culture of companies, it's a very, very different culture than a physics department. And just a general lack of awareness of career as outside of academia. Just not really knowing that this is actually a, a thing. Those are the comments from those employers. So to summarize, based on available information, we can say the following about the physics discipline. There's some content and knowledge overlap with other STEM disciplines, particularly technical skills, techniques, equipment, familiarity. There are characteristics that make us distinct from graduates from other STEM disciplines, um, able to grasp a wider scientific context of work uh, and formulate pro problem solutions from first principles, being able to solve problems really from that kind of blank state of, I don't know, but I'm going to figure it out. But there is some important content missing from the training, including communication leadership skills, ability to function well in an interdisciplinary context and an awareness of careers outside of academia. And students can engage in a degree of self-advocacy, and I'm going to talk about that next. But our discipline should provide them with appropriate, realistic training, realistic, for the careers they are most likely to have outside of the academic sector. Okay. What can students do? What can you do? Okay. I, when I regret, I have this really, really awesome brochure that I meant to bring for you guys, and I didn't, but I'm going to send some to, to order, and he's going to figure it out and get it to you all. Um, but I'm going to go through the main points. These are kind of the key elements of doing your own professional development work, which you have to do. It's very important. You Only you can do these steps, frankly. A detailed self-assessment. What do I mean by that? Well. You have to understand what you love. You have to understand what you hate. And I don't mean I love soldering things. I hate um, stripping wire. <laughs> you know, which I that that is accurate for me. <laughs> I do not like it. I always cut the wire, and it always made me mad, or it made me it kinked it, and it broke later. Um, what I'm saying is assess the qualitative aspects of what you enjoy. For example, when I got my physics PhD, I intended to go into physics education research. I wanted to be a teacher. Teaching is one of the things I'm most passionate about in life. Um, my life circumstances, as will yours, will intervene and may or may not make that possible. And maybe you have to capitalize on another opportunity. I got the chance to work this job at APS. I was recently at a meeting talking to a, a faculty member about, yeah, you know, go through weird twists and turns, and I never would have thought I would love this job at APS. And he said, well, you're still teaching. And I was like, ah, yes, I'm still teaching. You see, there, when you understand the qualitative aspects of what you love, that can really broaden, you're shifting the basis vectors a little bit. Like, 
you know, rather than focusing on the label, like this is the job title I want, like this is the kind of activity I want to do, you might be surprised how many different ways you can actually do that and scratch that itch, okay? Um, there are also great tools, and I highly, highly recommend you go see your career services office. A lot of people give them a bum rap. Well, they can't tell me how to get an academic job at visit. Well, guess what? Neither can your advisor, <laughs> necessarily. So, they're not useless. Um, <laughs> you need to go to them. They have things like the strong interest inventory. What that is, is they gave a survey to a whole bunch of people in a lot of different fields. Really weird questions, just random kind of effective domain questions. The people answered them. You take the exam, you answer the same questions, and it does like a DNA match, and it gives you the career paths that you have the most in common with. And sometimes it might reveal something very, very surprising or interesting, something you'd never consider. If you try to take this test as an individual, it's $250, because that's how they make your money. But oftentimes, what career services will do, they will buy a subscription, and it will only cost you 10 if you go to them. So go to them. See what it says. It might surprise you. Once you have a set of ideas of who you'd like to talk to, you know, say, uh, actually Peter Fisk, who gives a lot of our career workshops, his number one uh, match was Butler, which is interesting. I haven't taken it. I'd like to know it. It might be something really surprising. Um, but you can use connections. LinkedIn is one of the most powerful tools there is for finding people. How many of you are on LinkedIn? Okay. Every, every one of you needs to be on LinkedIn. Every one of you, for so many reasons that I won't get into. It's so important. You can use your second degree connections. That's, you, you know who you know, but you don't know who they know. It's a wide enough pool to be useful, but it's a short enough distance that it's manageable. You can contact your first degree connection and say, hey, I noticed your friends with so-and-so. Can you just introduce me to them? Sure. That's how it works, okay? And informational interviews are basically 30-minute chats with somebody. You go to their company, you ask them questions. Anything you want. What is your typical day like? What training did you get that really serves you? What did you wish you had known coming into this? Um, what are typical salaries for this job? That's a tricky question in a regular job interview, but it's not a job interview. You're just asking a question. That's really, really important information <coughs> to know for future reference. And if it goes well, if that goes well, they might keep your CV or your resume, or they might connect with you on LinkedIn, and maybe six, down, six months down the road, they might call you up. Hey, are you still looking for a job? Because we've got an opportunity. I think you'd be great. You know, they're already going to be impressed that you had that initiative. So it's a great, it's another member of your network, even at the very least. <coughs> and speaking of which, build your network. There's no right or wrong place to network. On a plane, at a happy hour, <coughs> when you're at a professional society meeting, not just in the talks, not just in the poster session, <coughs> but actually when you and your friends go out for beers, and maybe there's another group of friends that you meet up with, that is networking. Those people are connections for you. Because they go to a different school, they know different people. Maybe they have a relative that they could get you in touch with or a friend. Um, there's no right or wrong place to network. And all you need to do, you know, many, many physicists worry, you know, we have a reputation for being socially awkward, which I don't think is actually fair, because most <laughs> physicists I know are really outgoing people, actually. But, but even if you feel uneasy about the idea of kind of making small talk, it's a skill. It's just like anything else. You need to know two things. You need to know, you need to be able to tell somebody quickly who you are. I'm Crystal Bailey, I'm careers program, man program manager at APS. I work on all things pertaining to careers. Or I'm a graduate student at William & Mary, I'm working on X. And what you want. And I'm really, really interested in learning more about careers and policy. Those are the two steps. Describe briefly who you are and describe briefly what you want. That's it, that's all there is. And, and it works. There will, conversations will happen. Like, oh, I should really put you in touch with so-and-so. It's not as hard as you might think. And you should talk to absolutely everyone. <coughs> Keep a career journal. Okay, this is a really, really important tool. Uh, a spiral down notebook, something really simple. Um, and, and, and it's important. You know, record your thoughts, all your self-assessment. That's key. 
But what is also very helpful is if you record your transferable skills, every experience you have affords you with new transferable skills. And the way I describe it is a job description, for example, a resume and a CV are not the same thing. Okay, a resume is one page long. One page. The only place a CV is appropriate is applying for an academic job. Well, or some national lab jobs. But anything that's not academia or national lab is a resume that you're going to be submitting. It's one page long. And I think of it like a Lego keyhole. So you've got to construct a Lego key that is exactly shaped correctly to fit that hole. It's got to just fit that job description. Each resume you write unique to a specific job description. What do you build your key out of? Legos. What are those Legos over here in your bin? That is your pile of transferable skills that you have been writing down all these years as you go revisiting every time you do a new research project, every time you have a new experience. Write down a few bullet points. This is a new skill. Um, proficient in LabVIEW, because you did, LabVIEW is already, um, knows how to you know, use and test and control stepper motors. Um, when you did an outreach program, uh, you know, develop leadership skills by coordinating an outreach team that went to local high schools. These are, just write them down in a big list, or if you want to make it even easier for you, you can put them in broad categories, like leadership skills, analytical skills, you know, technical skills, whatever. But write it down as you go, because when the time comes that you want to apply for a job, you're gonna read that job description, you're gonna look in your book and you're like, boom, 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 you're gonna take those skills right out of your notebook and write your resume, okay? All right, so do that. Do it all the time. Capitalizing on opportunity, knowing good places to search for science and technology jobs. We definitely have the APS job board, we have job fairs, your campuses many times have career fairs. They can be tricky for reasons that I won't go into. Um, but the most important thing is that when you do get an actual job description in your hand, the caveat to what I just said, you know, obviously then if you're going to build a resume for a particular job, you need to read it. And I've actually had people submit resumes. I'm sure they did not read the job description. Read it, understand the skills they're asking for, and then with your resume and cover letter, address how you have those skills. Do that one-to-one -one mapping, connect the dots for them. Or, if it's something you really want to change direction. Let's say I've been doing this, but I'm, I'm pivoting, as they say in the business world. I'm pivoting and I'm doing something completely different. In your cover letter, explicitly address that. So they know you have read the job description, you have given this some thought. That'll up your chances. And know how to write the effect, an effective resume, not a CV. Kind of what I just said, they're not interchangeable. They're the only appropriate document for non-academic jobs. Should be one page long, and you write a unique resume for every position you apply for. I did a video tutorial converting a standard CV to a skills-based resume for a specific job. It's in our online professional guidebook, and I'll give you the URL for that. I did this very specific, so you should check it out. Okay, now I'm gonna talk about APS resources briefly. This professional guidebook that I just mentioned, um, it's detailed advice on all of these key aspects of professional development. For example, self-assessment, networking, interviewing, doing informational interviews, negotiation strategies, all these things are on our website in this professional guidebook. And the URL is go.abs.org slash guide. all right? And it's cool because we have these little web, we did webinars on this, but I also did five minute webinar clips that you can just watch from the page, it's great. And the resume tutorial I just told you about is among these pages, it's, it's here. Other things on the careers website, we have the APS job board. We have got a whole listing of physicists of people who are working in a diversity of areas and with different degree paths. We also have a um, job prospects pages, which are kind of BLS, Bureau of Labor Statistics style write-ups of a particular track. So bachelor's jobs in the private sector, um, medical physics jobs, uh, you know, PhD jobs, you know, we did the faculty ones as well. Um, so there are lots of different tracks that you can explore. 
And it gives information like job outlook, typical starting salary, training needed, et cetera. A lot of the employment and salary information is also accessible from the APS website. Get it in a nice, you know, clearing house. And our webinars, we have so many webinars we've done on careers and professional development topics. It's a great archive. <coughs> I'm gonna quickly talk about APS Local Links. This is a brand new initiative. Well, brand new, it's been about a year and a half. Um, <coughs> these are locally based grassroots meetups that happen about every six weeks. It usually uh, focused in a geographic area. They are meant to bring together <coughs> industry physicists, national lab physicists, academic physicists, students, all physicists who are local to a region to build relationships, okay? From the, from the student perspective, that means they get to meet some industry folks. They get to meet some national lab folks locally. From the industry perspective, I have it on very good uh, information for many of the existing ones. The industries come to recruit, and they have hired students from the local aid meetings, so it happens all the time. Um, so it's a great, it's a really great thing. Um, we have a DC Baltimore one that's kind of far away. If people are interested, actually here are our, our different locations. Um, if people are interested in actually trying to formulate one close by, we can do that. There's a process for that. So get in touch with me and I can help. Um, but you can learn more about them at that URL. Okay. Oops. Oh, I did that thing. Now, what can faculty do? Well, you can broaden your students' career focus. And a lot of these tools that I already mentioned, the webinars, the guidebook, job prospects profiles, <coughs> physics insight slideshow that's out there, bravo. It makes me so happy to see it, because I do it, <laughs> to actually see it in the hallways. Um, it's a great way to very passively let students know that there are a lot of different career options available for those with a degree in physics. And in fact, it's a recruitment tool because if it's outside your intro classes, you might have, I love when I put the, the slide that has the uh, MCAT scores of physics versus pre-med. So that's a different talk. Yeah. Um, anyway, so those are some things that you can take advantage of. Other resources, like I said, the AIP SRC. Our web page has a lot of single graphs that, you know, it's nice because you can like look for the one that you're looking for and just, it'll take you to the report, but then you can just see the graphic. But read the full reports because they're so comprehensive and they're so well done. They have tremendous integrity there and they do a great job. Um, and the local career services office. You too can also have a relationship with these people. Um, pass along our career brochure, pass along these slides, get them in touch with me, work with them because so many times I talk to career services people and they're like, what do we tell physics students, okay? You can work with them. They have great resources. You need to encourage more industry uh, um, contact and mentorship with students. There are some really, really cool ways you can do that. There is a new program that's going to launch in November and it's Industrial Mentorship for Physicists. And it's an online sort of clearinghouse to allow students and industry mentors to interact on a, about a six month period. Uh, that's coming soon. Keep your eyes and ears peeled for that. We also have an APS Distinguished Lectureship Program on the Applications of Physics. That is a person who has had a lifelong career in industry, um, who basically their job is to travel around to APS section meetings, but also colloquia, <coughs> and give talks about their careers in industry. And that's fully paid for completely under, under this lectureship. <coughs> so it's free. So ch check it out. The Local Links Program. Is another example. And LinkedIn, hey, guess what? You know, I hear a lot of times from faculty, well, but we just don't know where, we just don't have access to our students who go off into industry. Well, if you connect with them on LinkedIn today, you'll have a huge industry uh, set of contacts tomorrow because that's where they're all going. <laughs> and I've actually done that. I've had students I've met at APS meetings who I friended them or connected with them on LinkedIn. Four years later, they're, they're all in industry. Good tool for you too. Include physics innovation and entrepreneurship in labs and courses. This is a new thing that I'm really focused on. Um, experiential learning in maker spaces, <laughs> like what you guys have going. Enhanced co op or internship programs, that's another approach. Entrepreneurship tracks, where you actually bring in courses from other schools, interdisciplinary um, coursework. 
Uh, you can adapt your standard courses to include more relevance to applications or the workforce. You can create new, completely new courses for physics majors that focus on communication, IP, business structures, etc. There are a whole bunch of approaches. And in fact, there is a community of practitioners seeding around this idea. Um, VentureWell is a great organization. They were formerly the National Collegiate Inventors and Innovators Alliance, but they have been working with the engineering discipline for decades to implement entrepreneurship education. Um, ScienceWorks at Carthage College has a physics entrepreneurship bachelor's. Uh, University of Colorado Denver, Randy Tagger has built a phenomenal in innovation hyperlab maker space. Case Western has an entrepreneurship master's. Kettering University has the engineering physics track. And there are so many others. There is a community of practitioners that is coalescing as we speak. Very, very important. We had a conference in June 2014. There were over, over 50 institutions there and dedicated sessions on, uh, oh, sorry. We're also starting to implement dedicated sessions on physics, innovation, and entrepreneurship at every March meeting. Okay? So if you have something you want to say, which I think you guys do, come give a talk at the, at the meeting. And then there's also the pipeline pro program that we're going to try to propose in this coming January. Um, several different partners are involved, and the goal of this grant proposal is the development of a comprehensive set of implementation strategies for physics innovation and entrepreneurship. Um, once we have our first, assuming it gets funded, the first set will do their work in the uh, next years, academic year, and then we'll scale up to include additional institutions in fall of 2017. Okay, in closing, academic physics is not the most common path. Most grads at all degree levels go to the private sector, and many will do scientific research in, in the private sector. Students, and I want this to be clear, I want to say this loud and clear, I am not discouraging anyone from pursuing an academic track. God knows that is an important track. There will always be a need for people 